Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to this instruction course on pediatric oculoplastic disorders. We're going to talk about the pediatric ocular disorders in, and their spectrum. And it is a privilege to have such a wonderful faculty for their purpose. We have Dr. Kasturi Patachaji, who is a household name in oculoplastics and is a wonderful surgeon and uh, too many qualities to enumerate. Uh, <laughs> Mukesh Sharma, who is uh, um, the General Secretary of the Oculoplastic Association of India, a versatile surgeon, a very dynamic man who's taken so many initiatives. Dr. Shalu Bagecha, who's a senior consultant in uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital with, and it is a privilege to have a um, person like her with us. She's an excellent surgeon and a very, very versatile surgeon. Wonderful to have Rituja, who's uh, very, very dynamic, very energetic, and a very good surgeon. She's trained at Narayan Nitrale and is now a consultant at Vision Eye Center. And nice to have her at home, as I said. And, uh, but before we start our course and talk about the pediatric oculoplastic disorders, it's a privilege to have Dr. Mili Shakur as our keynote speaker. She is a wonderful oculoplastic surgeon and a wonderful human being. I've had the privilege of uh, knowing her for over two to three decades when I first went to Bangladesh, first of my four visits, and uh, a real joy meeting her every time at national and international meetings. And she's going to speak to us on a very important subject, her journey into management of retinoblastoma. So let's hear her story, uh, Dr. Millie. Please share your screen and let's have your presentation before we Thank go you, to sir. pediatric oculoplastic disorder. For uh, formal purposes, Dr. Shavakat Ara Shakur. Shakur. <laughs> okay, uh, very good morning to you all. And it's my pleasure to be here uh, as an international faculty and I thank uh, AIOS and especially Dr. Patabosh, Patabishraj, Dr. Mohipa Shazib, Dr. Namrata Sharma, and all members of AIOS. So I'll be speaking on retinoblastoma management in Bangladesh, my journey. So this is a boy, Dr. Sami. He was blind of two eyes of retinoblastoma. And most of the cases in the beginning we were getting were like this. And if we speak about the Bangladesh scenario, most of our patients get, comes from uh, rural settings. It is almost 64%. This is uh, my first 100 patients survey. And boys were coming more, maybe because this, those were the priority. And mean age of presentation was 32 months. Oldest presented at 11 years. Youngest at four months. Five children had um, family history and two children had of consequence, just marriage in between parents. And bilateral cases were 45% and unilateral 55%. These were the presentations why people reflex were the most of the present, uh, children presented with white people reflex, then proptosis, cytis, bulbis, trebis, mass, poor vision, hypema, vitreous hemorrhage, and ophthalmitis, like people, painful eyes. These are the pictures of our patients. In all our patients, we do. Uh, CT scan and B scan ultrasonography for documentation and for counseling purpose, it is um, very much important and also for uh, planning of treatment. And we follow the international classification of retinoblastoma, shield classification and international staging system for retinoblastoma for our patients. And our 75, 70% uh, of our patients were of group E and 12% of group B B and D and 3% age of group A and C. And stage zero or intraocular tumors were 43%. 35% had inflation without microinvasion and stage one, stage two had 13% and who had 
uh, adjuvant chemo and other modalities of treatment. Stage three had eight percent and one person has um, stage four. So in 2014, when I came back from uh, Center for Site after doing my ocular oncology fellowship under uh, Dr. Sandosh Munawar, I found that there is no infrastructure of RB treatment in Bangladesh. And it was also the cause why I went to Center for Site. So in 2014, we were getting referral cases. Uh, what we did, we did examination anesthesia, grouping done. Then we referred those cases who needed uh, chemotherapy to National uh, Oncology Department of National Cancer Institute of Institute. And we did enucleation with patients like I have shown you earlier, those. But the challenges were follow-up. So at that time, our common method of managing advanced retinoblastoma was enucleation. We did enucleation with orbital implant. Nobody was, uh, no enucleation was done without implant and we did it, it by my conjunctival technique. This is a small video of my surgery uh, we were doing in um, for enucleation. It is a myconjunctival technique. We are here I'm holding the, trying the, the rectus muscle. A very small video. And then uh, after tying the pore rectus muscle and uh, disinserting them, this is prolapse of the mus uh, eyeball and then uh, optic nerve is cut and eyeball is removed. removed. Eyeball is checked for the almost 20 millimeter of uh, optic nerve is cut and now orbital implant is given. And then we close by um, in layers. So this is after um, inoculation, we give processes for the patients uh, for functional and so that they can go back to the school and others and mix with the normal children. So ref in 2015, our uh, challenge was referred patients were not coming back for follow-up. And those who were reporting had incomplete chemotherapy or either they don't understand about the importance of follow-up or importance of chemotherapy. So we decided to start chemotherapy at NIO and to keep the, all, the, all the children with us so that nobody could be lost. So it is in 2015, this is my first case where I gave chemotherapy. Only one patient or two patients we were giving chemotherapy at that time. And now this is the intravenous chemotherapy. And we have almost uh, 40 patients in a week and 150 to 160 patients in a month. We are giving uh, intravenous chemotherapy from zero, 1 to 150 in a month now. So at that time, we started giving other immune uh, chemotherapy modalities like periocular chemotherapy. We started in carboplatin in 2015 and topotican in 2016 because topotican was not available at that time in 2015. So intravitreal chemotherapy, we don't give melphalan, we give topotican and if we started in 2016, but melphalan we don't give because it has many complications. So this is the case of group DRB. After um, intravenous chemotherapy, the tumor was gone, but there was vitreous seed and we treated with, with intravitreal chemotherapy and you can see the uh, regress and stage. And this is the group BRB. And after chemotherapy, it uh, was like this. It, it, the cases were like this. And it is a group CRB, which had, uh, after chemotherapy, intravitreal and intravenous, the, the, it is decreased with calcification. So we were happy, but in 2016, we thought of comprehensive center for retinoblastoma. So, uh, but it was not easy. At that time, we had uh, treatment options like cryotherapy, laser photocoagulation, but we have to depend on the retina department for laser photocoagulation. And we were doing nucleation and orbital implantation and chemotherapy in different dose, different groups. So 2016, it was a very difficult task. It was not a priority for the policymakers. They had other priorities like vitro-retina and uh, cataract. They wanted to buy FACO machines and uh, high-end uh, microscopes and other VR machines, but they were not, uh, it was very difficult for, to understand, make them understand. 
So negotiation was crucial. We had meeting after meeting, and then finally we could make them understand. And they recognized us as a separate department of ocular oncology and retinoblastoma uh, management team. So we have a dedicated OT day, we had a dedicated admission day, we have dedicated chemotherapy day. And eventually dropout reduced to minimum in 2017. We were very happy. So things were going very nice. And in 2019, a big year, we had the procurement of TTT, we got TTT, the government uh, ensured supply of uh, chemotherapy agent, then gets you need to put that in and to put it in. And the patient don't have to pay and uh, they will get, uh, when the supply was there, a new era started in the treatment of retinoblastoma in Bangladesh. So this is the first day of TTT in, at my center. Hmm. So after TTT, we got the TTT, the, this is the regress, uh, things are things are going better and patients were happy. We are we were happy. So our dream we have dream breast cam, black brachytherapy, intratrial chemotherapy, and research in genetics in RB in Bangladesh. So we have started intratrial chemotherapy in January 2021. One patient we did uh, intratrial chemotherapy in, and our dream is coming through. So this is the first case where we did the intratrial chemotherapy with our intra, uh, cardiac interventional cardiologist and interventional radiologist and our team. So brachytherapy is on the way now. We have uh, we are happy that India we have made in India black brachytherapy, which is less expensive, and we will be procuring that. And research in genetics of RB in Bangladesh, we have started a small study on genetic study. Let's see how it comes out. And rehabilitation, we have networking with blind schools. So that's who have uh, bilateral uh, visual loss or inoculation. They can go to the blind school for rehabilitation and voc vocational training. And so in conclusion, I, went, I want to say nothing is impossible. We started from zero. And we what we have, we need, we have to have a big dream. Need to work step by step to fulfill the dream. Not one day we will get everything. And dream big, I will I will tell the youngsters that dream big, but start small and gradually you will achieve it. Now in Bangladesh, we can manage or be more confident. We have this center, I can be proud of it. It is a comprehensive center for regional platform management. And this child, he, she came for, this is my first child who I gave a juvenile chemo. I have shown the picture. He, he, she was inoculated elsewhere with without implantation and I, I don't go for, I, I, I gave it given chemo, then I did secondary orbital implant. Now she is like this and she can be in the mainstream and like any other child, my child and your child, she can enjoy her life uh, with full um, accomplishment. And thank you for your nice presentation, uh, nice present, your presence. And this is with my mentor and this is with my team. Thank you. Thank you for your patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mili. That is an inspiring story. From one patient to 150 patients so that you can take care of the requirement of a country like Bangladesh, which is quite populated, quite densely populated, and being able to do all the procedures starting with the earliest uh, chemotherapeutic agents to intra-arterial therapy, brachytherapy, it is a journey worth emulation. We all need to, those who pioneer things in their countries or in their regions have a special responsibility and they, the way they fulfill it is really an inspiring story. Thank you, Millie. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the uh, pediatric disorders. As we know, pediatric disorders are not just congenital, they may be acquired as well. But there are special considerations in tackling pediatric oculoplastic and lacrimal disorders. These conditions are different because, the, because of the different anatomical considerations, different tissue reactions, and different behavior of the tissue as well. They are also different because the management skill sets required to manage them are different. It is therefore a privilege to have such a faculty to deal with this particular course. And uh, 
we are going to tackle all these subjects these the subjects both congenital and acquired including the field of lacrimal surgery i'll begin my talk first which is on congenital eyelid colobomas uh, we have... i'll interrupt dr grover just for a minute uh, just to give his introduction uh, though we all know him it's he is an internationally acclaimed oculoplastic surgeon a wonderful teacher we all have learned from him and his presentation over the years and he is a recipient of padam shri and many other awards so and uh, of course he is the chief instructor of this particular course so thanks a lot dr grover sir for giving all of us this opportunity and we all look forward for your presentation on lit coloboma please sir thank you mukesh it's the affection of you and all the entire oculoplastic committee and community which keeps us going and striving for our best for the patients thank you mukesh so i'll be speaking on congenital eyelid coloboma this is a subject i started to love when i was in my starting my oculoplastic services in 1984 in the maulana azad medical college and since then saw a number of cases to the extent that we had published in 19 2005 i think we had published 51 cases it was the largest series in the world till then congenital colobomas of the eyelids have been described over 5 centuries ago and maybe the result of abnormal migration of ectoderm and mesodermal tissues of the face however mechanical disruption of eyelid development by amniotic bands or various facial clefts may also be responsible these colobomas imply either partial or total absence of eyelid structures more often the upper lid is involved and in that case medial third is usually affected but almost one third cases are involving the lower eyelid these may be unilateral or bilateral the systemic associations are that it may be a part of a first arch syndrome first branchial arch development anomaly and golden heart syndrome and treacher collins syndrome constitute this syndrome associations with facial clefts of various types are also common most commonly 310 and 411 golden heart syndrome was the commonest association that we had been seeing presence of limbal dermoids temporal dermolipomas upper lid coloboma unilateral or bilateral pre auricular tags and vertebral anomalies constituted the golden heart syndrome treacher collins with lower lid involvement as notches in the lower lid was the second commonest association but as we said facial clefts were common and fraser syndrome was another common association we look at our observations later there are a number of other associations that are known so now we presenting uh, the data of our 65 cases um, which is the largest reported so far this was the publication in 2009 in journal of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus so we find that males and females are almost equally affected they may present early or they may present very late upper eyelid is involved in two third of the cases lower eyelid in one third golden hindhar syndrome in about 20% of the cases in our series and treacher collins and facial clefts in about 10% each the commonest presentation in the upper lid is as a unilateral involvement and bilateral constitutes only about 15 to 20% of the cases all of them are located medially supramedially and the size may vary from a small notch to huge size almost involving 3/4 of the lid most often they are unilateral 35 or 43 in our series 
And these are usually benign with no exposure keratopathy. Exposure keratopathy is relatively less common in these cases, constituting only about six of 35. And some of them rarely have an absent superior phonics, something which is much commoner in the bilateral group as we will see. In the bilateral colobomas, exposure keratopathy is the rule rather than the exception. And absent superior phonics with skin of eyelid running on to cornea is the commonest presentation in six of the eight cases. Constituting a simbleferon variant of cryptophthalmos and association with Fraser syndrome should be looked for. Bilaterality cases, two of them were small notches and not associated with any exposure keratopathy. Management of these cases starts with medical management, but most cases would require surgery. The surgical management is immediate when there are large defects, with, especially with those with absent superior phonics and with exposure keratopathy. But in those where the defect is small the def and there is no exposure, it may be deferred for three years or more. <coughs> And the surgical management is decided on the size of the defect. Attempt is primarily to try and do a direct closure or canthotomy closure with tens or with tensors so that pupillary access occlusion can be avoided. But those who already have a pre existing corneal, ex extensive corneal involvement, or those who are operated late, can be repaired by slit sharing techniques. Let's look at how we did these repairs. In these upper lid colobomas with exposure keratopathy, because the cornea was already involved, we could do lid sharing procedures in 11 of them. But in seven, we did tensors. 14 of these 18 had absent superior phonics, and we had to create a superior phonics using a mucous membrane graft mostly, but since we find that this hypertrophy is a great deal in children, now as the amniotic membrane grafts have become more easily available, we are often preferring amniotic membrane grafts. Those without exposure keratopathy can more often be smaller and be repaired by direct or tensors techniques. Lower lid colobomas may be again unilateral or bilateral. Unilateral ones are usually medial associated with clefts, and bilateral ones are usually those with Trecher Collins syndrome, smaller and in the lateral part. So, bilateral ones are with Trecher Collins, and they are usually a small notch. Lower lid colomomas are largely with facial clefts, and one with a rare coronal atresia and bilateral orbito oral cleft. The repair is usually by direct repair in the smaller ones, but in other cases, a more complex repair may be needed where the defect is larger and there are other abnormalities. So this is an example of a direct repair here where the notch has been corrected. There was a bilateral ptosis as well. So we did a bilateral fascial sling at the same time. Examples of tensors repair, we'll skip the video and closure by tensors technique. The tissues have less give. You need more laxity to be created on the outer side, but results can be gratifying. Although as we see, notches are more likely in these than in older subjects. A cutler beard procedure where pre-existing opacity is quite significant or the child is older can be done. An example, in a small child here with exposure keratopathy with repair. An example of difficulties involved is this one case of repair where there was a uh, two week infant with bilateral upper lid colobomas with absent superior phonuses with severe exposure keratopathy with an appearance like this with no vision presenting very early. We did a dissection of the superior skin created a phonics with a mucous membrane graft, as you can see here. 
and then took a tarsoconjunctival flap for repair of the internal lamina. Skin can be mobilized as it was excessive and taken from that which was present on the cornea. So this is the stage one, and this is after tarsoconjunctival flap was released, and we could get a good reconstruction, although simblepharon does tend to occur very often in these children because of excessive reaction. And we could get rid of the exposure keratopathy and vision could improve significantly. Example of a lower lid notch, which has been repaired here. And this is the unusual medial lower lid coloboma with coanalytresia and facial cleft. Here, we did a lateral canthotomy cantholysis, mobilized the medial canthus, and we then did a direct repair in this area and did a deep medial canthal insertion. And we could get a reasonable repair in this patient. So surgical results are functionally gratifying with, uh, we have very long uh, follow-ups. The problems include notches, wound dehiscence, or recurrence of simblepharon. So to summarize, the special considerations in surgery are that there is a poor lid laxity, particularly if you have to operate them young. In younger children, occlusion of visual axis should be avoided and mucous membrane grafts show excess proliferation, consider AMG. So congenital colobomas with their widely varied presentations are an extremely challenging problem, but can be managed satisfactorily in most cases. Thank you. We'll now have uh, the next presentation, which is by Dr. Mukesh. Dr. Mukesh speaks to us on congenital simple ptosis management, and Dr. Shalu will follow it up with management of blepharophimosis syndrome and Marcus Gantosis. We'll take the questions uh, together. Please write down your questions um, that you may have. We'll take it up in the panel discussion. Dr. Mukesh, are you muted? Please unmute yourself. So uh, my slides are visible? Yeah, they're visible. You are audible. OK, sir. So uh, whenever we receive a patient of congenital ptosis in a child, there are uh, most important question is when to operate this particular patient. Our traditional teaching says that a child has to be operated at four to five years of age. And this age is chosen because at this time, we find that tissue development is proper, good examination is possible, and this is the school going age. Though we can have a good examination even earlier also, but I think this point is of paramount importance. Yes, tissue development, especially levator development is not complete before five years of age, we do not have good aponeurosis before this. So ideally a patient should be operated at this age only. But exception is that whenever there are chances of amblyopia, whenever pupil is covered, then we operate patient early, maybe at six months of age only. And of course, in every patient, we have to do refraction under cycloplegia because many of these patients are associated with anisometropic amblyopia also. So uh, if we delay surgery beyond five years of age, then there are permanent uh, psychological issue with the child. Whenever we operate a ptosis patient late, we always find child as a depressed child. Uh, a child is never normal and never a bubbly kind of uh, person as we see a, uh, other children. So no point delaying surgery beyond this. After six years of age, every patient is treated as an adult. All the options, surgical options are open, whether it is levator reception, facial art, or silicone sling. If a person is younger than three years, then major surgical option available is silicone sling only. Facial art, we never do earlier than four years of age because uh, earlier than that, we do not find sufficient length of facial art. And levator, I do not perform earlier than six years of age because 
of the lack of development of aponeurosis and poor results. Whenever we contemplate sling in an infant or child, uh, a notion of temporary sling is given, but I think it's a wrong notion. We have to always treat sling as a permanent sling. And we always use silicon as a material of choice. Nowadays, because uh, with the easier availability of silicon and uh, cost has also cut down significantly. So no point using sutures because there will be more of chances of granuloma. It is less elastic and there will be 100% chances of resurgery. Whenever we do silicon sling, at least in my patients, there are less than 50% chances of going for a revision surgery. So it's a fair chance to be given to the patient to go for a sling as a permanent sling. Now, what are the advantages of silicon? We all know it's potentially adjustable. There is very less lid lag and leg ophthalmos, readily available material, very easy to perform. And when, when we discuss about the methodology, Fox's Pentagon is the method of choice. It gives you very good lid lift and contour. Single triangle can be used, especially as a rescue operation in facial data. Whenever you are having lesser length of facial data, this can be used. Contour may not be very good, especially whenever you are using silicon. So a brief video about silicon sling surgery. You mark Pentagon. Initial two uh, stab mark are um, around three millimeter away from the left line. Then two marks in line with the lateral canthus and medial canthus, and one central mark. Then you pass a stay suture. Then you give incision either by diathermy or by using your blade knife also. Now it is very important to have a tunnel here so that you can bury your end of silicon. So this is very important to have a long tunnel. So by making this long tunnel, you will be reducing chances of extrusion. Now, ideal to use both the needles in one eye. I have seen people using one needle in per eye, but ideal, ideally you should be using both the needles. Sleeve you can remove from the needle and cut it in half. These needles are malleable, you can bend them. Then pass it uh, from the lower incision because you are using both the needles. So ideally you should be passing above the tarsus then come out, always check that tissue is not entrapped here. In all the incisions, where, uh, whenever you are passing sling, tissue should not be entrapped. Ish, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, the, now we can. Okay, okay. So there's some problem in the net, I believe. So, uh, so I think rest is easy. We all know how to do it. Again, a signal issue, uh, Mukesh. Okay. Just a minute, I think. Maybe you can just... Uh... Of yeah, your own video, your own. Then just creating problem. So then you thread the needle, uh, thread the sleeve by the needle itself. Since you are using both the needles, so you need not to stretch the sleeve by needle holder. You can just thread it by both the needles, utilizing both the needle itself. So I, I think. Uh, there is some problem with the internet, so uh, I will think I will be moving ahead. Just try by switching off your own uh, camera. Mm -hmm. 
Sir, that is switched off. I think he is already switched off. Okay. I have not switched it off. Yes. So now it is visible. Yes. Just switch off your camera, maybe everything will be a little better. Yeah. Continue to speak. And here, Mukesh. Yeah. So yeah, now we can. Yeah, please go on. So, uh, there are certain pearl of using silicon sling. It should never be reused. You will have to titrate tightening according to the end point. Generally, it is at upper limbus and make a long tunnel. One very important point is that you have to combine the skin muscle excision in unilateral cases. Generally, after five years of age, if a child is younger than five years, then it is not needed because the skin is quite tight. But in adult, it is almost always needed because if you do not combine it with the skin muscle excision, there will be bogginess here and overhanging lid fold. So in this particular child, we have combined sling along with the skin muscle excision also to impart an equal lid fold and lid crease. Again, in this particular uh, child, though it's uh, the child is quite young, skin muscle excision is not done and you can see overhanging lid fold. So it's better, it has to be combined with the uh, uh, skin muscle excision. Facial ATA, uh, generally it is done after four years or six years of age. In children, seven to eight centimeter strip is enough. Adult, you require around 10 centimeter strip and single triangle facial ATA may be done as a rescue if smaller length strip is available. Marcus Gantosis, Bilateral facial ATA along with levator excision was done in this particular child. Levator resection, whenever you are doing in, a chil uh, in children, there are certain problems. Aponeurosis is underdeveloped in less than six years of age. So generally it is avoided. Wittnall's ligament also is poorly developed. And generally you require to do maximum levator resection for optimal correction. And high incidence of under correction and late droop. So here there are some, some of the results with levator resection. In this particular patient, you can see late droop occurring after levator resection. So to conclude, age bar for congenital ptosis surgery is getting lower. Silicone sling is the procedure of choice if patient age is less than three years of age. Parents should be... Uh, explained about the possibility of second surgery or readjustment in all childhood ptosis. And in nutshell, I believe that early ptosis surgery worth, uh, we have to always give uh, it as a permanent cure rather than performing it as a temporary. So it has to be done early to avoid psychosocial problems. Thank you. Thank you for your patience here. Thank you, Mukesh, for an excellent presentation. We'll discuss some of these aspects in more detail in the panel discussion, including the timing for surgery and uh, modalities for surgery. But uh, and now we'll go on to the complicated cases of congenital ptosis, the jaw winking and mark and the blephrophimosis syndrome, and none better than Dr. Shalu Bagheja to speak about. Am I audible, sir? Yes, please, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank Dr. Grover for including me in this session. I'll, today, I'll be discussing the management of two challenging entities and have no financial disclosure to make. Blephrophimosis syndrome is a congenital bilateral autosomal dominant condition, which is prevalent in several parts of the world, including India. The more four characteristic features include epicanthus inversus, telecanthus, ptosis, and shortening 
uh, of the decreased horizontal aperture. So the management is usually performed in two stages. The stage one is carried out at uh, at least three years of age, and the child is of at least three years of age, where the epicanthal fold is corrected uh, along with telecanthal and lateral canthoplasty may be combined if we want to increase the horizontal papillary aperture. The second stage uh, of uh, ptosis correction is performed six months after the first stage. However, if there's a milder uh, symptom signs, then we can go for a single stage surgery in these cases. And as already been stressed by Dr. Mukesh, if there's a visual axis is obscured, then we have to go for temporary stylistic sling to prevent amblyopia. So the first stage is correction of apicanthus and telecanthal fold. Various modification of uh, um, Z-plasty or double Z-plasty can be performed to correct the uh, apicanthus. Uh, for telecanthus, we have to shorten the medial palpable ligament and fixate it. So we can either do the plication or suturing to the periosteum, transnasal wiring, or we can make a bony opening and suture, uh, anchor the ligament with the help of proline. So our choices in mild telecanthus, uh, we do the MCT plication, and if it's a C moderate to severe, we uh, uh, plan for transnasal wiring. The most important step is the measurement and marking. So we need to measure the interpupillary distance and the intercanthal distance, which should be half of the IPD. And the, the correction we, which we want to do should be uh, divided in both the uh, eyes, on both the sides, and we should aim for slight overcorrection in these because there may be a slight regression. So here we have done the y to, uh, y marking, which will be closed as a V. This is small video. After uh, doing the incision and the subcutaneous dissection, uh, we expose the medial cancer tendon. So we can see the MCT, and then the incision is given uh, beyond the insertion of the medial cancer tendon, and the tissue is reflected, the periosteum along with periorbita laterally, and then the osteotomy is made as in DCR cases, however, the position is slightly superior and posterior in the uh, line of canthus, medial canthus. So the tissue is dissected close to the eyelid ma uh, margin where we want, as we want to uh, pull the canthus medially. With the help of 22 gauge needle, we thread the uh, stainless steel wire of 28 or uh, 30 gauge wire. And this uh, passes as a double, uh, double arm uh, do, and then it is passed to a uh, pull on the other side with the help of a facial alternator. So the wire can be threaded in the key of this uh, facial alternator. It is important that there should be any no loop formation as it may loosen the R effects. So once the facial alternator is pulled uh, on the other side, then the similarly the uh, with the help of a 22 gauge needle, the trans stainless steel wire is threaded to A. And this should be close, as close as to the middle uh, cancer tissue. So once, once we have uh, checked the correction, we have to um, <coughs> make the wire tighten it and then trim it and it should be buried in the osteotomy so that there is no exposure. And the closure is done in multiple layer. And we may have to remove some of the subcutaneous tissue and the dog ears uh, in most of these cases. So this is a, a pre-op picture of the blepharophimosis syndrome. This is a post-op picture showing the good uh, correction of telecanthus and following the facial artery sling as a second stage procedure. In milder uh, lephrophimosis, we can go in as a single state procedure when the Y to Y V plus T is combined with transnasal wiring and bilateral facial artosphine. This shows a good correction post operatively with a good closure. So, the transnasal wiring can is, be preferred in cases of moderate to severe telecanthus cases and it gives a deeply placed medial canthus correction. However, the ptosis correction is good result, but has an anatomical abnormalities. There is a limitation with, because of the anatomical abnormalities of the blepharophimosis syndrome. So coming to Marcus ptosis, it is a challenging entity. It is a, a synchronetic ptosis where the excursion of the upper lid occurred due to the movement of jaw because of the trigeminal oculomotor synchinesis. 
And for management, we need to assess the severity of ptosis, the excursion of jaw winking, and about 50% of the cases are sooty with squint. So we need to assess the ocular motility in these cases. The goal of surgery is to correct squint if it uh, is associated with squint. Then we have to correct ptosis and eliminate jaw winking if it is significant. So what are the options available to us? Uh, this is the uh, systematic out, uh, review article which has just recently come up and analyze the way uh, commonly performed procedure and their outcome. The surgical procedure which are pro commonly performed are bilateral levator excision with bilateral frontalis sling, unilateral levator excision with bilateral or unilateral sling. No hands method has used levator muscle as a sling material or like method has used combine the levator with frontalis in the intention of neurotizing this uh, levator muscle. And levator application or excision is mainly done for the ptosis correction. So 27 articles were reviewed and in the most uh, three of the three articles have shown satisfactory outcome in which the bilateral levator excision and bilateral sling was performed, both for ptosis and jaw winking. And unilateral levator excision with unilateral sling, they should also show the satisfactory result. The mixed outcome we came with in the unilateral levator excision with bilateral sling was performed. And a new hands method also showed the satisfactory outcome, but more so in the jaw winking phenomena. And levator application or resection was mainly for the ptosis correction. The, on comparing the technique, the study has shown that Quag et al. suggested that the 100% of the patients showed good result where bilateral levator excision was performed in, as compared to the unilateral sling. And most of the authors have shown the similar results. So coming to our choice, in case there is a mild jaw winking that is less than two millimeter, depending on the ptosis, we go for vesanella cervix or levator. And in, we have to overcorrect, over resect the levator in these cases. If there is a significant jaw winking, and to eliminate jaw winking, we have to do levator excision with cutting of horns. And sling can be done with a, uh, either a silicone sling or a facial alter material may be used. So our choice, and if we are performing a unilateral sling, we have to go for unilateral levator excision with silastic sling. And in case we have to go for bilateral, we do the bilateral levator excision with frontalis, uh, facial alter sling. This is a, a lady with a uh, unilateral mm -hmm. surgery is being performed. We are using the Pentagon uh, the technique as explained by Dr. Rukesh and the levator excision is done through the lid grid uh, crease incision. This is another child showing the elimination of the jaw winking following the levator excision. However, with the unilateral surgery is performed, there is an asymmetric leg of thermos and lid lag and downward gaze which need to be explained to the family before. So asymmetry can only be eliminated if we are doing a levator excision of both the sides with bilateral facial other sling. Coming to the surgical technique, we need to harvest the facial arta. The line is drawn from the lateral condyle to anterior superior line, about four inch line, and the incision is given in the center so that we can reach both the ends. Once the facial arta is exposed, the undermining is done both superior and uh, under the facial arta, and four inch strip can be uh, cut through it, and after trimming, we cut it into a four strips. So, Marking is done by the use of modified Crawford method. Where the, marking the center of the eyelid, the two inch marks are given on either side, and one at the lateral one third, and the other one at the medial one third. And diagonally perpendicular to it, two marks are made on the eyebrow, and the uh, next incision is given about three to four millimeter from the in the line of center of the eyelid. And one uh, the, through the lid crease incision, levator is excised. And after undermining the incision, the facial lata is passed from, uh, from one the lateral incision to the <clears throat> center incision and this pulled upward. One knot is given and the uh, assessment is done. And once we are sure of the correction, the two knots are made and it's secured by a fiber vital suture. And then the two ends are passed through the middle suture, uh, middle incision. And we need to excise the skin muscle as already been stressed by Dr. Mukesh, otherwise lead to bogginess of the eyelid. So these are some of the examples of the patient who has elevator excision with facial lateral sling has been performed. The child who had a double elevator palsy through the NAF procedure was done as a first stage and then a bilateral elevator excision with sling was carried out. 
So just to conclude, if the family uh, doesn't want a bilateral surgery, unilateral levotexigen with unilateral sling gives good result, but there are some limitations. However, the bilateral levotexigen by bilateral facial arta is the treatment of choice in these cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalu, for that excellent presentation. We will, of course, have a lot to discuss in this um, once we come to the panel discussion. I'll now request Dr. Rituja to tell us about the current management for congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. And finally, we'll have the icing on the cake by Kasturi's presentation after Rituja's presentation. So, uh, first of all, it's a great honor, uh, of course, to be a part of this uh, IC with so many uh, well-known and uh, experienced surgeons. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that uh, it's a humbling experience to work and uh, to uh, sort of learn from Dr. Grover. So that's a great thing for me. And uh, definitely to be here with Dr. Mukesh, uh, Dr. Shalu, and uh, one of my role models, uh, Dr. Kasturi. Thank you very much for having me. So I'll be talking about uh, congenital nasolacrimal duct obstructions, and I'll be covering uh, the talk in these uh, headings. So um, most children, uh, even if they have it, only 20% of them actually uh, present with it. Can in you the start your screen share, please? Okay. Oh, it's not started? Okay, sorry. Right. Can you see it now? Yes. Right, okay. So, um, uh, 20% of them in the first year of life, they present uh, with the watering and 80 to 96% of them res uh, res resolve spontaneously by the first year. So uh, just in brief, the nasolacrimal groove is formed uh, after six weeks and uh, the floor of the nasolacrimal groove uh, gets an ectodermal cord, which sort of starts canalizing at about four months of life. And this gets completed at birth or within the first few weeks after birth. So there are various causes of nasolacrimal duct obstruction in children. One is uh, the membranous block at the valve of Hasna, which is the most common or uh, stenosis from a narrow, narrow NLD at the inferior meatus, or a hypertrophied inferior turbinate and bony abnormalities as they grow older. So the common symptoms and signs are epiphora, uh, discharge, matting of lashes, skin maceration, and regurgitation when they press over the sac area. Uh, other things which need to be ruled out uh, when children present with watering is eyelid conditions such as blepharitis, congenital entropion, uh, epiblepharon, or conjunctivitis, foreign bodies, uh, corneal abrasions, keratitis, rarely uveitis, and congenital glaucoma. So on examination, definitely uh, there you generally do find a regurgitation or pressure over the lacrimal sac. However, uh, they can also just present with a raised tear. Your connection, Ritija. Again, can we try the remedy of switching off your camera? Okay. Um, try again. I, now yeah. we can hear you. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Can you hear now? Okay. Yeah. Yes. But um, we are not seeing your screen. Right. Yes. Share your screen. Yeah. I think they stopped my share. Yeah. I'll just share it now. Right. Uh, can you hear now? Yes. Okay. And uh, in some of the older children, uh, syringing can be performed. However, uh, this is usually discouraged as it can uh, lead to canalicular stenosis and things like that later. Uh, one of the uh, conditions which warrants an imaging is a dacryocystocele, which can uh, also uh, sort of have uh, respiratory obstruction at birth. So uh, it's important that uh, these undergo imaging. Apart from that, uh, patients with Down syndrome uh, commonly develop nasolacrimal duct obstructions and craniofacial malformations. So an imaging is warranted in such cases. 
so spontaneous resolution uh, the rate definitely decreases uh, as the child nears 1 year of age but definitely it is highest at 1 month to 3 months after 12 months of age you can see that it uh, sort of uh, declines uh, sharply and then plateaus uh, and the rate of uh, resolution after 12 months is uh, quite low so we can manage these patients conservatively as well as surgically so in conservative management uh, hydrostatic massage and topical antibiotics have classically been advised however uh, we need to shift over from uh, calling it a massage to a sac compression so this hydrostatic sac compression uh, is what we need to explain uh, properly to the parents uh, give a proper technique uh, and educate the mother well so uh, something which i had seen uh, earlier uh, during our sub specialty days uh, dr akshay had uh, spoken about uh, you know giving a whatsapp uh, video to the mothers to sort of reiterate how the uh, compression is done so that would be a very good addition to our armamentarium of uh, trying to get these uh, patients to respond well to conservative therapy so um nldo can be uh, generally watched for a year unless it is complicated by other factors such as skin maceration or any other complex uh, forms so uh, amongst invasive therapies the first line is uh, definitely probing along with the syringing and the second line would be repeat probing silicone intubation balloon dilatation and a dcr uh, whether inter external or endoscopic so with respect to probing uh, we generally can uh, wait for 12 months uh, to probe however uh, certain conditions such as uh, dacryocele you can probe them early and it can be delayed up to 4 to 8 years so the technique involves uh, nasal packing a uh, good examination meticulous uh, technique for passage of the probe and uh, confirmation of the patency with a syringing and it is done under general anesthesia so uh, first the upper punctum is dilated a probe is passed and the direction is sort of uh initially uh, medially and then uh, downwards and posteriorly and then laterally at the very end so this is an uh, example in an adult cadaver of exactly how the position of the probe is and the direction of the nasolacrimal duct so with respect to the success rates of probing uh, definitely it's good up to 12 months uh, but then again after 12 months it uh, starts to decline so the sooner you can uh, do it after 12 months the better and uh, there's a difference between the success rate of the first and the second probing uh, the second probing also has much lower success rates than the first probing so post procedure we should advise them uh, topical steroid antibiotic drops there are studies on uh, the efficacy of tobramycin dexamethasone um, and you can use any uh, similar kind of steroid antibiotic combination and uh, what we found is that steroid nasal sprays and decongestants uh, initially also help uh, keeping uh, them open Uh, some complications are bleeding uh, bleeding is usually due to a false passage and uh, inability to pass the probe down to the nld uh, sometimes uh, entry into the uh, submucosa of the lateral wall and of course uh, failure so uh, a failed probing could be because of a improper technique or a bony obstruction uh, or inflammation with age so uh, the more uh, older the child is the more uh, inflammation they've had in their canaliculi over the months so that is uh, one of the reasons and there are anatomical variations uh, such as uh, very probe impacted inferior turbinate going to the anterior end of the inferior turbinate and the maxillary wall so a failed probing can be managed uh, as i've mentioned before by a repeat probing or an inferior turbinate infracture or silicone intubation or a dcr after 4 years so inferior turbinate infracture again uh, the same preparation is done and um, a periosteal elevator is sort of passed uh, under visualization uh, beyond the inferior turbinate and the inferior turbinate is lifted and you generally hear a cracking sound at the end of the procedure again after this you do confirm patency by a syringing now uh, intubation can be monocanalicular or bicanalicular most commonly a mini monoca is used or a rittling uh, procedure is done again under uh, visualization so uh, it it's usually done for failed probing and can be done along with the dcr as well 
the problems you may face are uh, securing a passage, uh, having discharge post-operatively, and uh, extrusion of the tube. So uh, with respect to monocanalicular versus bicanalicular, ha they have been uh, pretty similar in their success and dislocation rates. So you can opt for either. Uh, another option is balloon dacryoplasty. So it can be a primary procedure after 12 months uh, in whom uh, probing has failed also or uh, silicone intubation has also failed. And it has a, a pretty good success rate. So uh, what is done is basically a, a balloon um, catheter is passed uh, in the same direction as we pass the probe and it is inflated to about eight atmospheres initially for 90 seconds then deflated then 60 seconds and deflated and then 90 60 repeated so it has a a, a good uh, dilation and uh, since uh, the foci of the balloon are radial they don't really produce any tears or anything and it is a little less invasive than probing or uh, silicone intubation and can be repeated safely now, uh, endoscopic uh, assisted probing uh, is uh, probably something which people are opting for a little more these days. And it permits the direct visualization of the probe at the lower end of the nasolacrimal duct. Uh, when you're not visualizing it, yes, you uh, do a metal on metal contact with your uh, periosteal elevator. But in this, you can directly see and uh, go ahead with any other procedures if you feel uh, need to be done, such as inferior turbinate infracture. Uh, Dacrocystorhinostomy uh, generally preferred uh, in patients who are five years or older uh, in unresolved nasolacrimal duct obstructions who have undergone multiple procedures. It can be done in external or endonasal form. Uh, however, there are certain issues with respect to the anatomy uh, in inexperienced hands and um, that they, they can be uh, prone to more scarring. So uh, definitely mitomycin C is a very good idea uh, in children and uh, most uh, surgeons opt to uh, do a stenting at the end of the procedure. So uh, a newer modality which has been found is the uh, dacryo endoscopy. So uh, in this, uh, a dacryo endoscope is used uh, to uh, sort of visualize the anatomy uh, right away. And then um, a bicanalicular stent is placed. And uh, these uh, this group uh, sort of found that they had a 100% um, success rate. So this could be something worthwhile uh, if we can start off uh, in future for ourselves. So uh, this was an important uh, sort of uh, study or uh, survey which was carried out uh, by uh, Dr. Akshay Naya's group, wherein uh, most of them advised sac compression up to one year of age. And uh, two years was the age limit for their sac compression. And uh, one year was the minimum age for advising probing. Uh, the upper age for pro, uh, age limit for probing being five years. And younger surgeons, uh, such as myself, uh, were probably more likely to offer a trial of primary probing in children between 8 to 12 years. And 50% uh, have started using nasal endoscopes during probing and 32% uh, for intubation. And 81% would rather repeat the NLD probing uh, with adjunctive procedures over a dacrocystorhinostomy. So uh, this is uh, just a basic outline of my talk. So uh, when there is a C CNLDO related epiphora, uh, you can uh, do a, a Krigler uh, lacrimal sac compression and observe. If it's a complicated one, you can do probing uh, under 12 months. If it's a non-resolving uh, simple one, you can go for probing. And um, if probing fails, uh, repeat probing uh, with inferior turbinate fracture, intubation, balloon dacryoplasty, and multiple procedures fail or there's dacrocystitis or bony obstruction, after four years of age, you can do a DCR with intubation. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Ritija. That was a very beautiful outlining of the entire scheme of things as you follow in the congenital nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. We will go on to some discussion on this, and this is a subject that does excite a lot of discussion. But before that, we want to hear Dr. Kasturi speak to us in management of fractures in children. And as usual, we expect a treat. Yes, sir. Can you see my slides, sir? Yes, Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
And I also said, I would like to thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity to be in this course. And like, I've been speaking many things which I have learned from you, sir, like you're a mentor for all of us. And so my perspective on pediatric orbital fractures. So when we talk about the orbital fractures, basically it is a blow in fracture or a blow out fracture. The blow in basically is seen in the case of a roof fracture, especially in case of children. However, the blow out fracture is more common amongst the adults. So there's a dictum that children orbit are not small adult orbits. And it's very important that we understand that the children orbit is completely different from that of the adult orbit. In children, the frontal bone and the orbital fracture, roof fractures are commonplace because there's a very high cranium to face ratio there's incomplete or absent pneumatization of the frontal bone and also prominent orbital rim. And if you look at this, if you look at this here, this is at birth where you see hardly the maxillary sinus is being formed. And as the child grows by the age of five years, we have a much pneumatized maxillary sinus, but still incomplete. And as the child grows older, by the age of 14 years, the whole maxilla undergoes pneumatization. And by the age of 16, you can see all the pneumatization of the sinuses has happened. So if we look to this data, the cranial volume to the facial volume at birth, it is eight is to one. And as the child grows, the cranium becomes small and the face becomes larger. So by five years, it is four is to one and by adulthood, it is two is to one. There's a very nice concept of the eye tooth, which usually that is a canine tooth, which usually gets erupted only at the age of 12 years. So this is also considered as a condition or as a factor which prevents or resists the orbital flow fracture, which is not usually not seen in the young children. So these are some quintessential example of how the ongoing sinus and the facial development impacts the fracture pattern and makes it rare to have a typical blowout fracture in a young child. And what we commonly see in a wild, uh, young child is the wave of the white eye fracture, which is basically a green stick fracture and where there lack of any periocular signs, but this can be very serious because the entrapped the muscle gets entrapped leading to necrosis and also there can be oculocardic reflex. So what is this green stick fracture? This is a minimally displaced fracture, which predominates in the children because the pediatric bones are very, very elastic and they deform to elude the fracture. So in general, what happens, the pediatric bones are very cancellous. So this is against the Young's modulus. We know the Young's modulus is directly proportional to stiffness. And because the pediatric bones are less, uh, less stiff and more uh, elastic, so the pediatric bones can absorb more energy during the impact and can resist the fracture. So in pediatric orbit, we see that there is a splint where there's a network of ligamentous tissue, which usually prevents the prolapse of the orbital contents, even if there is a blowout fracture. But this is usually not seen in the adults. In adults, the splint is much friable. And also whenever there's fracture, the periosteum usually gives way they are allowing all the orbital contents to drop in into the maxillary sinus. So what is the trapdoor fracture that we see in the children? This trapdoor fracture is basically a linear fracture with the entrapment of the inferior rectus muscle. So what happens when there is a fracture and the fracture should be quite a severe fracture in order to lead to a blowout fracture in the child. And as such, the rectus muscle gets, um, you know, I mean, prolapse in the maxillary sinus. But what happens because of the elasticity as the trauma force ceases, the bone floor, the bone segment recoils back. But as the bone recoils back, the muscle does not recoil back and stays remains trapped there, which can lead to serious complication like Voxman's ischemic contracture and also the oculocardic reflex. So basically in pediatric case, we get a very commonly the trapped door fracture, which I have already showed you, where you can see the muscle breaks and trap. This is the CT and the MRI that you can see here. And the other common is the open door fracture, but the open door fracture is much less as compared to the trap door fracture, but we do get open door fracture even in children, especially when there's a road traffic accident, which can lead to a big fracture with approximately 50% of the orbital flow being fractured. So when I talk about blowout fracture, we all know whether it's an adult or it's a pediatric, the main theories are the buckling theory and other is the hydraulic theory. So, but the most important thing that though we are speaking about the orbital fracture, if we look to the cranial and the facial part as a whole, the most common fracture amongst the children is mandible, followed by the NOE, which is quite common. And I have seen quite a few of the NOE fracture in children, and then comes the orbital fracture. <clears throat> 
But how do we classify? There's a very nice classification which came in the PR's journal, which they say the type one is basically a pure facial and which can be graded from 1A to E, and the type two is basically craniofacial. But the type three is when you have an orbital fracture with other fracture patterns, especially when you have a floor fracture with the inferior fracture, which is a type 3A. Or you can have a ZMC fracture, which we usually call a tripod fracture involving the zygoma. And you can have the NOE fracture, which is 3CE. And also you have the LIFO2 and the LIFO3. So these are basically the fractures we see in the, uh, in the pediatric children, the most common being trapdoor, but also you can see other fractures. And how do we examine this patient? A very detailed history is very important. Go the examination general status, which is most important. Then we go for the local examination, go for the Im imaging and see whether the patient needs the acute surgery or immediate surgery, or we can defer the surgery. These are the classical clinical features, which you can see both in pediatric and the adult, but the most important in any pediatric uh, case, we need to examine the intraocular examination very well with a very good evaluation of, of the ocular motility, the post-duction test, and if possible, uh, exophthalmometry and also a diplopia charting. Imaging is a gold standard where we need to image and we need to examine the axial, the coronal, and also the sagittal so that we can see the fracture in the same plane in all the three sections. And But the question is, when do we intervene? So immediate intervention is done, especially in wave of where we have an oculocardic reflex. If there's intractable diplopia in the primary case, or you get the inoptimus, which is rare in case of child or in case of a severe globe subluxation. However, if there is symptomatic diplopia and the fracture inoptimus being more than two, and if there's no oculocardic reflex or not a very grossly deformed situation, then we can wait for approximately seven to 10 days. However, where there's minimal diplopia with good motility, with no significant inoptimus, we can just observe. So imaging is the gold standard, like situation like this, you can see when, when the child looks up, the eye does not move. This is a trapped or fracture. As you can see here, this is where you can see the inferior rectus has been trapped here. And this is as the fracture has gone back, but the muscle has not gone back and remains trapped as you can see in the MRI below. And the surgery should be done in order to release it. However, when we do, when there's an inoptalmus, how do we manage the situation? So the most important is people are still believing, many of the surgeons still consider the autogenous bone graft to be the gold standard because the autogenous material, which really revascularizes well, Many surgeons prefer the resorbable plate, but there are different types of resorbable plate, which can be a poly L lactate, that is a rapid soft, or it can be poly D lactate, it can be PDS, it can be PCL, that is poly caprolactone. So there are different types of resorbable material, and there are multiple st studies which shows. Some uh, says that it gets resolved within two months, but a very beautiful paper in BMJ by Gangadhar and Stephanie, they have shown that it can last as long as two years. So there are different schools of thought, but still I believe that even till today, I feel that when you have a big fracture in the pediatric case, because you do not see much of prolapse of the tissue, you might see a fracture. Titanium is still the gold standard because it has a very, very long track record, which has initially started by the craniofacial surgeon. It is, has a very good tensile strength and most important and you can do a molding, you can do a 3D contouring. And usually in children, we do not prefer the med port because it has got multiple disadvantage, hematoma being one of the major disadvantage. And you follow up is difficult because they are very radio lucent, the med port sheets. And situation like this, if you look at this child, this child has come with a frontal bone fracture. And the cause of the frontal bone is traumatic where you see a pellet. So these are the situation is challenging because we as a oculoplastic surgeon at times are a little scared to touch the frontal bone because we know that when the frontal sinus, it bleeds, it's very difficult to control the bleeding. So this situation where you have to use something to a navigation system because in the navigation, we have an advantage. I'll show you, yeah. This is, you can track it. You just need to follow the tunnel. And if you, the point of entry and where exactly you want to target, where with a very, very minimal manipulation, you can take out the pallet without causing much injury to the adjacent structure. And also you can salvage the eye as you can see in this child. So, but this case I really want to share because I was discussing with my fellow. I thought that it is worth sharing with everyone how beautifully this case has been managed. She is a 14 year old girl. As you can see that she had the exotropia and there was a FGT2 
And also when there, and there was also a MR tuck that is being filled and she had diplopia in all the cases that you can see here. And when the investigation has been done, this is a medial wall and trapped um, fracture with the anterior medial rectus. So in such situation, you also need the help of the ENT surgeon and that has been managed so well as you can see here, this is the muscle that has been entrapped. And if you look to this slide here, this is how initially a peritomy has been done. And then this has been followed by exposure of the medial rectus. And then the ENT surgeon comes into play. And when you pull the uh, muscle from the orbital, from the ocular side, you can see this is the muscle that has totally been prolapsed into the posterior ethmoid sinus and how beautifully it has been repaired with the septal cartilage. So this is something where the role of the ENT surgeon is very important along with an ophthalmic surgeon and beautiful results. Just finish in one minute. And sometimes what I have mentioned, the NOA fracture, these fractures are real common in the children though initially I was also not aware. But when I have gone through my literature, I have seen that even the advanced type where you have the type three, the community is very common. As you can see in the child having a very bad NOA fracture, so this is also sometimes you have to do to know the volume. You, I sometimes you the mirroring and do a navigation and you need to repair, but here you need to give a volume because there's almost a globe subluxation. There's also sublux and dystopia of the medial canthus. And this is what is the empty. This is the empty B uh, plate that I usually prefer in such children. And along with it, you also go for the, uh, I mean, management of the canthal dystopia. And this is how the how he looks after approximately a month following surgery. So to conclude the changing anatomy and the physiology of the pediatric craniofacial skeleton gives unique characteristic to the pattern and the clinical presentation of pediatric orbital fracture. And these factors really determine the management, whether we should go conservative or we should go for surgical. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Kasturi. That was a really wonderful speech all encompassing and all aspects presented so beautifully. Thank you, sir. We'll now go on to the discussion and we'll uh, request uh, Millie to join in for the discussion. We can have the questions starting from the first talk. Um, if there are any questions from any of the panelists, we'll begin with them. With the congenital coloboma talk first. Wonderful results, sir. But am I, um, sir, have you tried the lid switch procedure, especially when you know that the child is in the embryogenic stage, sir? And what is your uh, results on it, sir? No, I haven't done the lid switch yet in a child. But yes, but yes, that is certainly one of the good options. Have you done some uh, lid switch cases? What yes, are the results I've like? Done only three cases, sir. From the lower lid, I just switch off and take it to the upper lid. The mustard is uh, procedure. Yes, the mustard is switch. Yeah. Only thing is that um, the advantage is immediately the child gets some amount of vision because the cornea mm -hmm. remains exposed. Like he can use that part of his vision. But mm -hmm. again, you need to again do a two stage procedure, and after six weeks, you need to separate the lid. And so it will permit the I vision to be retained uh, partially, even though yes. you are doing a, a, yes, a split sharing procedure. Yeah, that should be a good idea. Mukesh, how many cases have you done and what normally are the techniques that you have used? Uh, sorry, sir, one important phone came in. We were talking about lid switch, lid switch surgery, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could not hear the question completely because of some. Yeah, so we, are, we are talking about any procedures that you are uh, fond of doing in congenital colobomas and um, what has your experience been? Yes, sir. So in uh, congenital lid colobomas, first thing is that uh, if we operate a case, say, uh, more than two years of age, then there is, I have found that there is some retraction on the colobometa sides. So, uh, and some rolling of, of lid margin. So if we uh, try to unroll the lid margin, then we may achieve some amount of lid lengthening. So I generally try to do that unrolling part instead of uh, shaving, if, shaving it off the lid margin. Previously, what I was doing it, that I was shaving off the lid margin just to raw it up. Now I do not shave it. I just make a superficial debridement kind of thing of a skin and then try to unroll it. By doing that, I achieve some amount of lengthening and that helps a lot. And uh, as everyone try to repair uh, it by cantholysis and canthotomy only initially, if colobomas are not too large, then we are able to do it 
by this only initially we have reduced palpable fissure say up to one year or so but after one year or so palpable aperture becomes almost identical to the other eye and then lid sharing procedure uh, i have also started using lid switch technique nowadays just to have an uh, con uh, amblyopia concern with the uh, uh, cutler beard technique so Millie, your experience uh, sir, I don't do any. Uh, I do the surgeries like direct closer or with tangent semicircular slab. And I did one or two uh, lead sharing procedure, but I stopped doing that uh, for like if it develops amblyopia. So I stopped that. I don't do lead switch. I think those bilateral cases are the tough ones where there is a associated skin involvement and absence of superior phonics. So I've tried amniotic membrane graft in the last few and the hypertrophy and the recurrences have reduced. So I think that may be a better option than uh, earlier we did not have uh, and they have been doing these cases for about 40 years. So the earlier part we did not have AMG uh, available, uh, processed AMG available and it wasn't easy to coordinate and um, to get uh, um, AMG with from cesarean cases as well. So now that is a very good option for superior phonics reconstruction. I think. Your presentation, wonderful presentation. So many cases and different types of management. It, it, it is wonderful. Thank uh, you. I have uh, something to ask, sir, here. That yeah. uh, in those cases where we are having associated first brachial arch defect, uh, like Fraser syndrome and all where defect, lower lid defect is going up to the upper lip. Their uh, uh, maintaining lid height is very difficult. Like after some time, lid again tend to be dragged down. So uh, how do you uh, manage these kind of cases? And sometimes you may need to do a secondary procedure with a graft, with a pallet graft where the tissue is short because direct uh, repair does work sometimes after drawing the structures but mobilize as i said since the tissues are rigid there is a uh, very little give here and you even with canthotomy cantholysis you are short of tissues at times so for the lower lid also you can do a, a, a procedure of rotation from the outer side and uh, of uh, and that allows a little extra skin and uh, tissue to be available but still you may sometimes have that retraction and you may need to do a hard pilot graft plate we'll go to congenital ptosis now and uh, mukesh very well outlined the uh, his choices and i agree with him that i do um, silastic sling even in infants um, Millie, any reason why uh, there is a, a school of thought that initially you do just a suture? There are some people who would just do that. Yes, sir. I, some I, people I, just do a suture rather than a silastic sling in infants when they do ptosis correction. Yeah, uh, we are doing with proline in just. Yeah, any reason why you do not prefer to do it with a silastic in the reason is silastic uh, is not available in Bangladesh very easily available. That's the reason. If it was available, maybe I would have gone for that. But it is not easily available in Bangladesh. So I I prefer to, uh, I have to do with Berlin. I have no other option. That's the thing. What was the norm at uh, Narayan Netrale? I think uh, everyone everyone was managed with uh, silicone only. I just I just want to ask uh, uh, something for Dr. Mukesh. So um, since uh, I uh, with a smaller incision for harvesting facial arta, I sometimes struggle to sort of get the full length. So uh, any tips on uh, with a small incision how you can get a nice uh, length of facial arta? Just, you should see his life surgery. It's amazing. You just yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> That's why. Uh, well, a uh, uh, tip is that in, in initial phase, you make two incisions. One at the top also. So by making a small step kind of or one centimeter incision at the top of the line, 
mm. there you will be able to mm. identify the top part of your facial data and you can cut it under visualization rather than cutting it blindly so right. once you get that feel then you can mm. convert yourself to a single incision and in mm. single incision the another tip is that hold facial data from your left hand with the blunt forcep and try to feel the tuck of suture a tuck of caesar on the left hand <laughs> like uh, uh, if you are feeling that tuck of caesar on your left hand by which <laughs> you are holding the facial data strip then you will be able to have some idea that your caesar is touching the facial data at the top and then you can make the cutting motion so that's very important to have a feel on the left hand of <laughs> caesar which you are holding in your right hand Okay. Where do you get this scissor? It's a very nice scissor. Long general surgery, yeah, general surgery, yeah. plastic surgery, general surgery. That's true, actually. Okay, blepharophimosis syndrome. Um, any comments, Kasturi? She has shown so beautifully. All the steps covered so well. Only one thing, sir. Now it is instead of um transnasal uh, stainless steel wiring. Yeah. Uh, have you tried with proline or polyester? I have, I'm going switching to polyester, sir. Any? Do you think that, like, I feel that it has should, should work as well. I yeah. mean, proline should work as well, um, but uh, I haven't yet tried it. But I what what difference there has been is that initially I started with the really thick stainless steel wires. Now I've gradually shifted to thinner ones, which are much easier to handle, 28, 30. So that makes it easy. And of course, a lot of trimming of tissues is required, as uh, as Shalu so beautifully pointed out. Anything to add, Shalu? Or Shalu? Sir, I need the tips from seniors to improve myself. No, no, you are doing a wonderful. Sir, I have a question for Dr. Kasturi because time is uh, here. Short. Yeah. So, can I ask, sir? Yeah, sure. So I wanted to ask you, you suggested the use of titanium clays for pediatric fractures. So what is the uh, age you prefer titanium? Because as you mentioned, these are growing orbits and we are putting the screws. So is there any contraindication for the use? I do, uh, there is no such contraindication for the screws because you see when the craniofacial surgeon, they use it for a big cranio, uh, cranial surgery, like for croissants and all. So they have been using all these titanium screws. But now the concept is that since the pediatric cases, we do not have so much of inoctanus. Do we observe or we put a, a resolvable ones? So resolvable, I have got very limited experience. It is very recently the osteomash people, they have come to us and we have ordered a few. So I have got very limited, but I have seen in one presentation, Sapta, Dr. Sapta Girish has shown four cases. And he was in, even Savari had done a few cases and they're getting very good results. But me, if I feel that if there is really a more than two centimeter, like real big fracture is there, then I definitely I go as a barrier. And the titanium one, especially I want this, I use a thin one, the, which is approximately 0.5 millimeter by the synthesis, which hardly gives you any, I mean, the volume or thickness to it. And I usually use the two screw on both the sides. And I have done pretty good number of cases and I have been following it. But not a single case had any exposure. Only one patient had what we call the fibrosis syndrome, where sometimes the fibrous tissue grows within the openings of the titanium sheet. And that case, like later, like when there was a restricted movement again after three years of the surgery. So at that time, it was really difficult to remove all the fibrosis because it has already grown into all the openings in the titanium. So this is one of the possibility that can happen. Like amongst all my cases, I had seen only one case. I agree with you. If there's a large fracture, and especially if there are medial and flow fractures, then titanium would be the first choice. Dr. Rasha Kumar. Uh, last, last question, last question for a minute is about uh, the failed probing cases. Can um, each one of you tell me your choice? This is the last one. Um, okay. have one last minute, sir. Yeah, one last minute. Yes, sir. Uh, fail probing, if done at other center, then I would like to repeat myself, but under nasal visualization, under endoscopic visualization, if needed, 
we do in fracture of turbinate or any other major pathologies dealt with. That, that's wonderful. Um, Emily? Same, sir. Same, sir. I will repeat. Salu? Then. I will repeat, sir. Repeat yes, the sir, program. If you're done again. elsewhere, I'd like to repeat. Otherwise, I'll go with, uh, if not done earlier with endoscope assisted, then I'll do endoscopy assisted and intubate also. Great. I think endoscopy is a great procedure. And in fracture, I found to be very, very useful. I think but even for endoscopic visualization, that is a great help. I think with that, we'll conclude and would like to thank you all for a really wonderful presentation and a wonderful discussion. Thank you all. It has been thank a privilege you, working with you. Thank you, sir. Thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashokumar Grow. I think uh, a fantastic uh, lead throughout the session. And I must say, you know, all the participants also, you know, an active and a healthy interaction throughout the session. So thank you so much, all the speakers.